So in this section of the playlist, what we've been dealing with is basically sequential logic circuits, which are logic circuits that deal with sequence. And so we've already covered a lot of very simple sequential logic circuits, one of the easiest ones to wrap your head around, and oddly one of the most versatile when it comes to making sequences, is the counter. Um, and so the counter is basically just going to go through the sequence 1, then 2, then 3, and then 4, and so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to making any sort of sequence, that's basically your starting point, it's just a counter. Um, for example, if you want to create a counter or a sequence that deals with every third number instead of every number, um, we can just take that counter register and we can run it through a multiplier, multiply everything times 3. So this sequence then becomes 3 goes to 6, then 9, then 12, and so on and so forth. And so, so long as the sequence has a pattern, we can almost always generate it using this sort of counter register and some kind of a combinational logic circuit. However, even if the sequence doesn't have a pattern, like this one here, we can still create it using a sequential counter simply by well, creating our counter circuit, so 1, then 2, then 3, and then 4, and then just using a lookup table to map these values to each other. And so even if the sequence doesn't have any sort of discernible pattern, we can still make it very simply using a counter register and a lookup table. And so, like I said, even if there's no discernible pattern, so long as we have just a straight sequence of numbers, we can create it simply by using a counter register and a lookup table. And like I said, that works, uh, that's true for any random sequence. Again, so long as it's a straight sequence, meaning it's one number after the other and that pattern will always hold true, you can create that sort of sequence using just a counter register. But what happens if you don't have a straight sequence? What happens if you have something like this? Or what if you have something like this? Or what if you have something like this? or like this, or like this. In those sorts of situations, you don't have a straight sequence. You have a lot of branching sequences. You have loops, you have branches, you have paths converging on each other. This is a very, very complicated sequence. So how do you build a circuit that can handle it? Well, if the title in the top left corner here didn't give you a hint, the, cir the circuit that we can make is a state machine. Now, I've already had a couple of videos in this playlist cover state machines and what they are and what they do. Um, in this video, I want to go over how you can design and build one. Now, there's different ways that you can build a state machine, and each one has their own advantage and disadvantage, but I want to show you the way that I typically make my state machines because it's the easiest to wrap your head around, and it's the easiest to get up and going very quickly. So I'm not going to overcomplicate and obfuscate things at all here. It's very, very simple. If I want to build a state machine of any kind, it always looks basically the same. Um, I start with a register here, register, and that represents the current state. Whatever the state the state machine is in, it's going to be held in this register. The current state then is going to be fed into a lookup table. And that lookup table is then going to take that information and it's going to determine what the next state is and then present it back to the register. And then on the next clock cycle, that next state is going to become the current state. That's basically it. Uh, there's no magic to this whatsoever. The only magical part of this whole circuit is basically what's in the lookup table. Because what the lookup table does is, like I said, it takes in the current state and it trans uh, turns it into a the next state based on this sort of graph. And so how does it actually determine what's the next state? Um, or rather, how exactly do we build this lookup table? Um, it all has to do with these transitions. If we look here, um, each one of these circles represents the state. These arrows are, what, are what's referred to as the transitions. And so what this lookup table has is it basically has uh, these transitions encoded such a way that it can take the current state, look at what its valid transitions are, and then produce the next state based on some additional information. That, I would say, is the only misleading bit right there, is the some additional information. For example, we can see here in the 13 state, we have three different paths that we can go down. We can go to the 9 state, we can go to the 8 state, or we can go back to the 13 state. How exactly do we choose which path we go down? And so in order to choose what path, we have to look at some kind of auxiliary information. Maybe we have some input i, and we say here i is equal to 0, 
here i is equal to, and we'll say 1, and here i is equal to negative 1, and I don't really have a whole lot of inf room there, but um, basically just taking an input, if i is equal to 0, we loop, if it's equal to 1, we go to the 8th state, if it's equal to negative 1, we go to the ninth state. And so that lookup table, not only is it going to take the register uh, or the current state as the input, but it's also going to take that i input. And then, of course, you can reuse uh, inputs. You don't have to have a different input for every state that has a branch. For example, here, if this 8 has two paths that it can go down. Um, and we can have another input, say input r. We can say if that's equal to a 0, it goes that way. If it's 1, it's, it goes that way. Or we can just use the i input again. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can set this up however you like, whatever um, configuration works for the situation that you're dealing with. Um, but the only thing you have to keep in mind is whatever inputs your state, uh, your state machine needs, uh, there has to be a correlating input on the lookup table. So let's go ahead and take this graph here. Let's turn this into a lookup table that we can use in a state machine. So there's a couple columns that we're going to be dealing with. The first one is the um, current state. Um, we also have the condition. And then based on the current state and the condition, we will produce a next state. And so let's just go through this table here. We can see in state zero, um, so we create an entry in the table, current state is state zero. There's no conditions that we're dealing with, so we're basically just going to transition to state three. So the next state is state three. That is one transition, and that is one entry in our lookup table. Then from state three, again, there's no condition, so we're just going to go straight to 13. So three goes to 13. Now in 13, we have three transitions. So this is going to produce three entries into our table here. In the first, uh, in the first entry, we're going to deal with this loop. So in state 13, if i is equal to 0, uh, we are going to transition back to state 13. Likewise, if we are in state 13 and i is equal to 1, we're going to transition to state 8. Likewise, in state 13, um, if i is equal to negative 1, we're going to transition into state 9. Then let's deal with state 8 next. If we're in state 8, we have two paths that we can go down based on the condition of r. So if we say r is equal to 0, um, we are going to transition to state 9. And if r is equal to 1, we're going to transition to state 7. And so simply by building a transition table like this, what we can do is we can translate this into a lookup table, basically. Um, I, I would recommend a PLA because there are certain situations where uh, certain inputs aren't going to be considered. And so having that flexibility is actually very, very helpful in that situation. Um, but we can translate this into a lookup table, basically, uh, connected to a register, as I described before. And that's our state machine. We would effectively have a circuit that implements this graph. Now, there are a few pitfalls that you do have to, to watch for when you're creating a state machine like this, and that is when you have a state that considers more than one input. Um, in the previous example, like I said, we had three different paths and we basically all just, uh, they all just consulted the i input. But what if you have both i and j, and you say we take this path if i is equal to zero, um, this path if i is equal to one, and then this path if j is equal to one. That seems pretty reasonable, but consider the fact that if j is equal to 1, it's going to want to go down this path, but depending on the state of i, it's going to want to go down one of these two paths. In this case, you have a situation where the transition table will return two different transitions or two different states. You don't want that to happen. You only want one state or one transition to be returned at any given time. And so if a state considers more than one input, what you have to make sure is that all transitions also consider more than one input. So in this case, if we want this path to be taken if j is equal to 1, then we want to only consider these paths if j is equal to 0. So if i is equal to 0 and j is equal to 0, we take this path. If i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 0, we take this path. And in this path, if j is equal to 1, um, we take this path. You might think that we'd also have to consider i in this situation, and we can, but remember, it doesn't matter which state that i is in at this point. If i is equal to 0, we're taking this path. If i is equal to 1, we're taking this path. So we could actually create 
two paths with j equal to 1, and we'll have i equal to 1 here and i equal to 0 here, and that way we cover all four combinations of i and j. But again, both of these paths are just going to go to the same location, so you may as well just combine them into one. And in doing so, it doesn't matter what the state of i is, it's going to take the same path. So for that reason, this path only considers j. And so looking at how we would translate our uh, table of transitions into an actual lookup table, uh, it's actually not too terribly difficult. Like I said, using a PLA is probably the most uh, versatile solution here because there are situations where you do want to ignore certain inputs and a PLA is what would allow you to do that. Um, but again, turning it into any sort of lookup table, it's not very difficult. So we'll start with the, this table of transitions here, just something very basic, just to get the idea across. Current state is equal to zero. Um, so if we look over here, we have our um, three inputs, which will represent our state. Since we've got a maximum of five states, we need three uh, binary inputs. We also have inputs i and j, which get their own input as well. And then that uh, produces three next state outputs, um, n2, n1, and n0. So if we look at the current state zero, uh, we're basically going to connect the first line to the zero input of S2, S1, and S0. Um, and because we're not considering any conditions, we're not going to connect either I or I prime or J or J prime. Those are gonna be left completely disconnected. Um, and in this case, because the next state is equal to a one, um, we're basically just going to connect uh, N0 to the output like that. Likewise, if the current state is equal to one, that's going to be a zero, zero, one on the uh, on the input here. Again, we're not considering any transition information, so we're we're not considering the inputs, and that's going to go to state two. Now we get to look at uh, something with a condition here. So if we're in state two, um, which again is going to be zero, one, zero, um, we're only going to be considering the j input because again, this one is going to be uh, a valid transition if j is equal to one. All the other ones, j has to be equal to zero, just like this uh, example before. So j is equal to one. We're going to connect this line right here, which is the j line, not the j prime. Um, and then because we're not even considering i, that's not gonna be connected at all. That's gonna go to state zero. So we can basically just leave that as it is. In fact, we could even leave that transition out entirely. It doesn't even matter. Again, state two, we're dealing with um, two inputs now. We're dealing with j equal to zero, i equal to zero. So again, state two, we're just going to connect those like that. And then if j is equal to zero, we're gonna connect that there. And if i is equal to zero, we're gonna connect that there. Then this transition is valid. We're gonna go to state three. And then I'll go ahead and do one more. Again, we're dealing with state two, so zero, one, zero. Um, if j is equal to a zero, which is there, and if i is equal to a one, we're gonna transition to state four. If we're in state three with no condition, we're gonna go to state four. And if we are in state four, we're gonna go to state zero. And again, because we're going to state zero, we could in fact just leave that out. In fact, what I usually like to do in these situations is I like to make zero my reset state. And that way, if there's any sort of invalid um, state condition that happens, it's just gonna go straight to the reset state and it's gonna start the sequence over again. So you can definitely leave those transitions that just go to state zero out and it will basically just default to a reset. Um, or you can make that sort of your, your trap reset state and then make st um, state one your start of sequence, in which case all these zeros you would replace with one. Either way, it doesn't really matter. That sort of thing is entirely up to you. This is just to show you how to turn that into an actual circuit. Now, a state machine is pretty useful in the fact that you can create some very, very unique and very complex transition sequences. Um, but that's uh, seemingly that's all it's able to do is just create sequences of numbers. How exactly is that useful? Well, what you can do is with each of these states, you can actually uh, attach an action. So here we could say do x, here we could say do y, and here we could say do z. And so in this sort of situation, you would have um, basically a state machine that would first do x, then do y, then do z. Um, if you had 
a loop like this, you could have a state machine that could do X, do Y indefinitely, and then when it's done, do Z. Um, you could also have loops like this, where instead of do X, do Y, do Z, do X, do Y, do Z, you have do X, do Y, do Z, do Y, do Z, do Y, do Z, and then do X again. And so if you need this sort of complex sequences of actions, you can basically tie actions to specific states. And then when the state machine enters that state, that action will be performed. And so if you were to actually take a look at that as sort of a circuit, what we would have here um, is we would have a register. We would have our transition lookup table. And that would feed into that. That would feed into that along with our inputs. And depending on the state that the, um, that the state machine is in, we would want to do a different, uh, we would want to perform a different action. So what we could do is we could take that current state, we could tie that into sort of an action lookup table, and that would create whatever action we wanted to happen on the output. And it's this particular configuration that we, uh, that we have right here with a, uh, a lookup table connected directly to the state. Um, this is what we refer to as a more machine. Now I bring up that little tidbit of information because there is actually another way to configure a state machine to produce um, action outputs, if you will. And that is instead of having a separate lookup table connected to the state register, um, we can actually have the transition lookup table produce uh, the actions as well. And so what that would look like is we would have a lookup table like this. Um, it would take inputs here, it would produce this next state here, which would go into the state register. That gets fed back like that. And then the actual action values would be produced right there. This particular configuration is what's referred to as a melee machine. And so what's the difference between a more and a melee machine? Why do you have the two different circuit configurations? Well, as I previously stated with a more machine, the action that you're going to get is going to be directly um, mapped to the state that you're in. So for every action that you're going to have, you have to have at least one state for that action. Whereas with a melee machine, you can actually have far fewer states than the number of actions because it's not the state that determines the action that happens, it's the transitions. This means that if you have multiple transitions going to the same state, each dictating the, uh, the circuit to do a different thing, that particular state is effectively going to have a different action associated with it depending on which transition brought it there. So if we come into this state through this transition, this state is going to do X. Uh, if we go into the state through this transition, it's going to do Y. Um, and if we go into the state through this transition, it's going to do, do Z. You can see we got three actions for only one state. And so you might think that, well, no, you need a state for each of these transitions, but not necessarily. We can have um, state M over here, and that can actually have three different transitions to state N. Um, depending on particular conditions. And so what you get is you get three or even potentially more actions from just two states. There are advantages and disadvantages to both styles of state machines. And obviously, you know, you're know you not gonna have the one true state machine that's going to work for all situations. Which type of state machine you decide to use depends entirely on the situation that you're dealing with. Maybe you need states that are mapped directly to actions. Maybe you need more actions than you have states available. Which one you choose is entirely up to you. Um, however, understanding which one you should use takes a little bit of getting used to. So my recommendation, uh, try out a state machine or two, uh, see how they work and get a feel for it. Um, after a while, once you start getting used to state machines, you'll start to get an understanding for which one's used in which situations.